On this special edition of The Big Interview, we go in studio with the Red Rocker, Sammy Hagar. At 68 years old, I still go out and give everything I got because I'm so grateful. I'm not like saying, oh, I'm the best singer, I'm the best, this, best. I don't care about none of that. I'm as good as I can be. That's, that's kind of where I'm at today, you know, and I'm kind of digging it. For years, he was the front man to Van Halen, one of the biggest bands in the world. With a lifestyle that really was all about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Take me inside. Tell me things that neither I nor anyone on the outside knows about what goes on on the inside. <laughs> oh, Dan, you're asking. You might get me in trouble. You know, I'm. It's... No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and just like his hit song says, he's a guy who really can't drive 55. So, question: What was your driving record before you <laughs> did? I can't drive 55. <laughs> My driving record was pitiful. I think I had like. 43 tickets or something like that. Have my license taken away three times. Look at us. Me and Uncle Dan are gonna go for a little ride. <laughs> Life in the fast lane with rock and roll Hall of Famer Sammy Hagar. <laughs> the big interview starts now. Before Sammy Hagar came along, Van Halen was no doubt a big time rock and roll band. But when Hagar replaced the legendary lead singer, David Lee Roth in the 1980s, Van Halen vaulted to another level. Hagar's electric voice, combined with Eddie Van Halen's screaming guitar, raised rock music to new heights and decibel levels. Parents who fondly remembered their own wild enthusiasms for Beatlemania or the Rolling Stones now found it was their turn to shake their heads in horror as the kids went crazy under new anthems of anarchy. Yet, for all the onstage antics, Hagar himself was a model of discipline and hard work. Lessons learned from a tough childhood. Sammy Hagar grew up poor in Fontana, California, and started playing music with a number of bands. Eventually joining Montreux. He then burst onto the music scene with a successful solo career, selling out arenas and making a name for himself with songs like Your Love Is Driving Me Crazy before joining Van Halen. Under Hagar, Van Halen scored several multi-platinum albums and won a Grammy, an American Music Award, and MTV Video Music Awards. They were later inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But you couldn't have kept me from here with a shotgun, so uh, I'm honored to be here. Honored to be here. But after 11 years together, Hagar says he was kicked out of the band. Fortunately, Hagar's years after Van Halen have been more rewarding, at least financially, than his time with them on stage. It turns out Sammy Hagar had a knack for music and business, big business. He's earned millions on everything from selling tequila to 10-speed bicycles. He's written a number one best-selling book, and he enjoys the spoils of success. Notably, his garage full of Ferraris, which is also home to his studio, 
where he was gracious enough to talk to me about his long and storied career. Hello, Dan. Hey. How are you, sir? Hey, man, how are you, doctor? Thank you for doing that. Doctor, whoa, that's a, that's a mighty high, uh, <laughs> for a guy with, with barely a high school diploma. <laughs> well, the old doctor. Red Rocker himself. Where does that name come from, by the way, Red Rocker? I wrote this song in 1976 called Red, mm -hmm. and um, I was, I did a show in 77, and I was walking down the street, and somebody called, yelled, and said, hey, the Red Rocker. And, and then I, another time, a guy comes up and gives me a newspaper article, had a picture, and it said the Red Rocker, Sammy Hagar, played Seattle. It was in Seattle, Washington. Right. And I thought, hmm, Red Rocker, that's kind of cool. Next time a guy yells at me, hey, the Red Rocker. I'm going, I guess I'm the Red Rocker. I, I, it, was, it was forced upon me, and I just accepted it. But it I've got so much there. ground I want to cover with you this afternoon, but let's start with professionally. Professionally, who is the Red Rocker? Wow. I don't know, Dan. <laughs> Let me ask him. <laughs> I'll be right back. Well, you're a singer. Well. You're a guitarist. I think the Red Rocker is my stage persona. Mm -hmm. I think it's what I... Um, invented about myself when I get on stage I'm a nervous person and I'm I'm scared to death and still today before I'm on stage I'm a wreck my wife can't be around me she goes oh my god you settled down um, I care a lot so I get out there and I don't know what to do with myself so I just run around and I sing and I yell and I scream and I play guitar and I go my songs are twice as fast as they're supposed to be and I in between songs I yell and blurt out a bunch of gibberish because I don't think about what I'm going to say until I'm out there. And that's the Red Rocker. He's, he's just kind of a manic, crazy uh, performer. But it's because I'm nervous. I'm, I'm well, fair to say the Red Rocker is a Hall of Fame rock star, super mega rock star. Now, as a person, as a person, who are you? <laughs> uh, I'm a great pop to my kids, and I'm a great husband to my wife and uh, to my friends and family. I'm just a guy, I think, that just really is so um, humbled by my success that uh, he just, this guy just goes around smiling all the time because I'm pretty happy about it. I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of shocked, you know? Uh, and I really think that that is who I really am deep down inside. And that's why I think I'm still a good performer. At 68 years old, uh, I still go out and give everything I got because I'm so grateful. And, and it's really true. I'm not trying to be anything. I'm, I'm not like saying, oh, I'm going to show them I'm going to be the best you know, guy out there. I'm the best singer. I'm the best, best, best. I don't care about none of that. I just go, I'm as good as I can be. And uh, that's, that's kind of where I'm at today, you know, and I'm kind of digging it. Listen, you know, you've lived the world of, of rock and roll seemingly forever. I mean that as a compliment, nothing else. But how have you done that? How have you, how have you stayed in shape? You, you seem to be in good shape both physically and mentally. That doesn't always happen to aging rock stars. Well, I'm a physical maniac. You know, it's like everything. I've been physical my whole life. I've, you know, I'd be, I've run 35, 40 miles a week from when I was 26 when I started finally running. I did that till I was in my mid 40s. 20 some years of, of running, I mean, every day. Uh, some days I wouldn't, but I mean, it would be like, I'd run 35, 40 miles a week. And I always ate properly because I discovered good food as a child. My mother was, <laughs> you know, we were poor, so we had a garden, we had our own chickens. We were farm to table, you know, like uh, my whole life. So I never had junk. And when I finally got to eat junk, I didn't like it. So I'm, I'm not a health nut, but I really eat healthy, and I still do. I drink. I've done drugs in my life, you know, and I stay up later than I should many nights, you know, in, in the old days and partied myself for, you know, pretty hard. But I never went on binges, and I never was addicted to anything and had to go to rehab. So it seems like that's the answer, because all the guys that didn't do that, that I was hanging with and partying with, it'd say, <laughs> I'd say, I'm going home, and then two days later, they'd still be doing the same thing. I'd come back and say, oh, my God. Uh, those are the guys that are falling apart now, you know. Um, I always say I got brakes on my car, you know. I like everybody's got a gas pedal and a brake, and right. some people just step on the gas, and I always 
hit that break when it's time, and I've been a pretty lucky guy because uh, I don't even like to be really drunk or really high and out of it. I don't like that. Well, kind of weird. I think I got some little angels on my shoulders or something because I'm not the smartest guy in the world, you know. <laughs> well, you mentioned angels on both shoulders. Are you religious? I think so. I, I, I believe in God, and, and I believe in believing in God. Just believe in a higher power, and there must be something connecting us all that's got a energy in itself or something. I mean, it's the hardest, hardest thing to explain is what God is. <laughs> well, when you were a child growing up, did, were you taught to pray? Were you into prayer? Well, I was raised a Catholic, so yeah, uh, we, you know, I used to pray. But as a child, I would pray four things. Make me a rock star. Yeah, Please. well, feed me, you know, <laughs> get me some new shoes, you know. It was really <laughs> pretty that, that basic. And I used to pray, you know, um, that my parents would get back together, you know, when they divorced. That was tough, you know, for me. Every kid, it's, it's hard. I'm, I'm sure. Um, and I, all my prayers came true except that one. But, you know, I wrote my own prayer with my wife, Kari, now. When I, when I got divorced, I decided I would never lie again. I don't, I don't lie to people. I used to lie to my ex-wife. I used to lie to my friends. I used to brag and say I had more than I did, you know. <laughs> so uh, I decided I didn't ever want to lie again. And then I started deciding about prayer, that you don't ask for things, you give thanks. It just seems a little more, uh, I don't know, a little less, you know, going around praying, oh, I want to win the lotto, oh, God, please. You know, it's like, that just sounds really bad to me. Like, stop it. You know, God's not going to listen to you if, he, if there's such a thing as God listening. Well, you mentioned you had a, a tough childhood. Uh, tell me about it. <clears throat> Oof. You're going to get me choked up now. I'm going to have to get my sunglasses out, you know. I don't do interviews without sunglasses because I'm such a softy. <laughs> Whatever it takes, all. <laughs> okay. Well, my father was a, a bad alcoholic. Like, not like a guy that just drank. He was like a guy that would get a couple of drinks in him and he would beat people up. Not the kids, thank God he never did that to his children. And why, I don't know. But he would beat my mother up. He would beat up the neighbors. Then the cops, somebody called the cops. And he'd beat the cops up. He was an ex-fighter and he could knock people out. This was his big deal. He could knock a guy out with one punch, anybody. And if he didn't knock you out, you know, and you get him on the ground, he, 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 was, he was a mess. He'd, he'd want to kill you then. It's like, you know. So there were times we didn't have a place to live because my dad was an alcoholic, so he'd get, we'd lose our house. We never owned a home, first of all. We always rented, but we'd, he couldn't pay the rent. He'd be in jail. My mom couldn't pay the rent. So we'd go camping. We'd live in a tent and stuff, and we'd take our friends. My mom would drive to school, take our friends. Um, our friends would go, hey, man, can we come hang out with you guys, you know? <laughs> So I didn't think we were having a hard time until I really started growing up and seeing what other friends had. And, and then I started realizing I was really poor. And I went through a, a down period where I, was, I didn't feel like, oh, man, I can't date that girl. Man, her dad would throw me out, you know, if he knew about my life. And so I kind of got down and out. Um, and then I started playing music. And I got to tell you, yes. <laughs> Music At what age was that you first start playing music? About 14, 15. I started getting into girls, you know, high school. Um, then I got a car. Once I got a car, I was done with school. <laughs> you know, <laughs> me and my buddies would ditch her and we had a band and we'd go play, you know, and we'd go to the beach and, and you know, get girls and stuff, you know. So, um, but up till then, it was tough looking back. I can't believe I made it. And the thing that makes me so happy when I go around smiling all the time. Why is Sammy so happy? Well, hell, the guy, you know, he, he did okay. He could have been like, whew. Um, but I really, looking back and I think, you know, it's like we were really, really poor, you know? We were really half the time homeless. The longest it was ever goes for nine months. And I just remember us, we bought a new car. We had a nice house to live in, you know, relatively nice, but it was a rental home. And then when my dad went off that time, my mom said, that's it. I'm leaving him for good. I want to talk about music. But before moving on, a couple of things you said caught my ear. I want to go back to them. One, you said your father was pretty good with his fists. In fact, very good with his fists. Did he box amateur yeah. professionally? He, bo he boxed professionally. And um, 
I've got a scrapbook. It's all we got left in my dad's thing because we moved around so much. And this scrapbook is like my brother and I are like, you know, we, we'd put it under our arm and run out the door, you know, and we'd have... So did you try to box? Yes, I did. My dad called me champ. Now, this is a real good thing, Dan. I think it's good for young people and for parents. My dad, as bad as everything was, told me, son, you're going to be the champ of the world. You know, hey, champ, everything was pat me on the back. You're going to be somebody. You're going to be somebody. And all my dad would say when he'd get drunk, we'd start saying, when we knew he was getting drunk, it was like, my mom, uh-oh, here we go. He'll be going, I could have been somebody. And I could have been a champion. I could have been champion of the world because he fought Manuel Ortiz five times. He fought him three times as an amateur and beat him. And Manuel Ortiz is one of the greatest bandweight champs of all time, five-time world champion. Right. Um, and he, then he fought him as a professional. My dad started drinking. And my dad was picking lettuce because he couldn't get a real job and he couldn't train, so he'd just take any job he could. Right. Had a couple kids. And then Manuel Ortiz became a real fighter, and he beat my dad twice and as uh, professionals on his way up. My dad never got in the top ten, I don't even believe, but he had eight, his first eight professional fights were by knockout. He knocked guys out because he was a big puncher. So you, you tried boxing yourself? Yeah. Box amateur, golden glove, something no, like that? No, not that. I, every day I'd come home from school when my dad was around, yeah. and if he was working a swing shift, he'd be out there eating a sandwich, getting ready to go to work or whatever, and, uh, and he, he would uh, say, put on the gloves. My friends wouldn't come over my house. <laughs> I was pretty good, too. And so my dad would say, put on the gloves. I, me and my brother, if we didn't have friends over, and my brother's three years older. He'd make my brother get on his knees and fight me. And, and it was, but he'd make us box every day. When we return, more of my interview with Sammy Hagar. You won't want to miss it. In the early 1980s, Van Halen rocketed to the top of the charts with Jump, featuring Diamond David Lee Roth on lead vocals, Michael Anthony on bass, Alex Van Halen on drums, and his brother, the incomparable Eddie Van Halen, on electric guitar. Too much traffic, I can't pass. Meanwhile, Sammy Hagar was enjoying his own success, selling over a million albums, and packing arenas around the country. But after years of constant touring, Hagar was ready to throw in the towel. That is, until fate stepped in. I want to take you back a ways. Uh, you were considering retirement before you got the job with Eddie Van Halen. Tell me about how your love of automobiles, you have a deep and abiding love of cars, how that brought you together. So looking back now, it's so funny how things happen. So I buy this Ferrari 512 Boxer, my first really big time Ferrari. So I buy it from this guy in LA who could get one. You couldn't get one, so I found this guy and I bought it. So when I went on tour, I gave it to him for the first tune-up. And uh, I guess while I was gone, Van Halen had broke up and Eddie was kind of down and out. And he had Lamborghinis that he would take to this guy to get service too, because this guy was a ace mechanic. And uh, Eddie's looking at my car. And he's going, wow, who's that? Who's, whose car is that? That's a nice car. Is that for sale? And he goes, no, that's Sammy Hagar's car. And Eddie goes, oh, because I'd met Eddie a couple of times. He was a fan of Montrose, my first band. And uh, he's going, oh. And Claudio goes, oh, you should get him Italian. You should get him in the, into your band. He's a good guy. He's a good guy, you know. <laughs> Eddie goes, you got his phone number? Yeah. Gives him his phone number. He goes in the guy's office and calls me. Now, that... I joined Van Halen. We sell 42 million records. They have five number one albums, you know, and tour the world as one of the biggest bands in the world. That is pure coincidence. And I was ready to retire. I was leaving that tour. I just made a whole bunch of money, and I didn't know what I was going to do, but I said, I'm, I'm tired of working this hard. You know, since I was 26 years old, 24 years old in Montrose, 73, I worked every day of my life. I was either writing songs in a studio or recording songs or going on tour. That was it. It's, I, I go uh, right, you know, new album, uh, 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 since 73 and then in, in 84, I'm going, that's enough. You know. But it turned out it wasn't enough. No, so let's see. <laughs> I don't on, think there is now. <laughs> on March 27th, 1987, 
you do you perform your first show with a Van Halen in Shreveport, Louisiana. I want to put an exclamation point. Remember, I'm a Texan. I know Shreveport for the Hayloft country music. First of all, what were you doing in Shreveport, Louisiana? We played, and I played before Van Halen, every city. I, I played Shreveport 10 times. I, I had... This was not the Louisiana Hayride. No, we were in the <laughs> arena, 10,000 people, 12,000, sold out. The first show, the album had, I, I know, I remember all of Valerie Bertinelli's hometown. All the uh, hoopla about me joining the band, but no album had come out yet because we hadn't finished the record, but our manager booked the tour. Right. The tour sold out, you know, first day, every show we did, 136 shows, whatever it was. And that show, I was scared to death because when we're going out, we're going to play the whole new album. I said, I don't want to play the old, just the old stuff. Let's put, you know, and Eddie and all, we all agreed, hey, let's show them what we got. We had a fantastic record. Well, you're also under pressure because you're succeeding. I didn't use the word replace. You're succeeding David Lee Roth. Got to be a lot of pressure. No, I didn't feel pressure. <laughs> I didn't. At the time, as a solo artist, I was really as big as Van Halen. At that time, I was selling out double nights everywhere in the country. They were doing about the same. We both, they had just hit that real big one with the song Jump. They finally had their big, you know, not a number one album, but they had their top 10 uh, really kind of broke them into a different league of record sales. Mm -hmm. But everything else to us was kind of on the same level for the few years before that. They were more flamboyant going out and, you know, being uh, rock stars. So I felt so comfortable with the music that we were playing. I was fine, but I was nervous on that first show because I didn't feel that the audience was gonna sit there and listen to us play a bunch of new stuff. But we came out and we opened the show and they knocked the barricade down and came rushing up and Eddie and I just looked at each other, let's go, we got them. And, and it was, that was a big ride for, for me, being in that band. We, we broke all the rules and all the records and, and everything we did, it was like, um, broke all the rules. Give me special. an example of one of the rules you broke. Well, uh, first album, we didn't make a video when MTV was the biggest thing that was going. Mm -hmm. They begged us. The, the, we had meetings with our, our management would go to meetings with Warner Brothers and, and MTV guys saying, how can we get these guys to make a video? We don't want to make a video. People want to see us, come and see us live, right? Unheard of, right? Um, and finally, Warner Brothers and MTV paid for the video. M most bands, you pay $300,000, $250,000 videos, they take it out of your royalties. Right. And um, we got, we held out until Warner Brothers paid for all of our videos. We never paid for a video. So we, that's about $4 million we got easy relative to other bands. That's breaking rules with the record company, with the MTV <laughs> and, and with, I got it. with I got ourselves. It. And then, um, then we released singles it wouldn't, the first single we released off the album were, were not the hit. Why Can't This Be Love on, the, on 5150 was, but the rest of the years, right. the next record, we released Black and Blue off the second album as the first single. No video. It's like, no, we don't want to make a video on that song. We'll make a video with the single that's going to be a big hit. But right now, they'll listen, the radio will play anything we give them. <laughs> and we give them, you know, obscure, nasty lyrics, you know, just do it till we're black and blue is pretty... Yeah, uh, pretty, pretty nice. Pretty rank. Pretty rank. And <laughs> but we were pushing the buttons and push and, and breaking the rules and, and having a good time doing it. And it kind of gave us a little attitude that we didn't have to put on airs and go out and pretend to be rock stars. We kind of went out there with kind of smirky, not not bad guys, you know, at all, but just kind of like we had... Kind of outlaw rockers. Yeah, we kind of look at each other. We could wink and say... Yeah, we got it. We're kicking butt on this. You know what I mean? It felt pretty good. It was. It kind of made a self confidence and put us in a different league. I got to say, the band Halen Air was just in a different league of anything in rock and roll that I ever been involved with. Well, let's stay on that for a moment. Now, David Lee Roth, granted a great performer, but on the record, he has he's known to have a big personality. When you succeeded him with Van Halen, did you feel pressure to be? larger than life, replacing him. What did that feel like? What was that like? I came from a different school. First of all, I was a great performer. I was in better shape than anybody then. I could go for two hours and run and jump and scream and jump and thing, and I could sing and play while I'm doing it. Um, I didn't, I never really had a lot of respect for Dave. I mean, he was a good front man of that style, but that wasn't 
anything I ever wanted to be. Growing up, when I was saying, I'm going to be a musician, I was looking at Stevie Winwood. I was looking at Eric Clapton. I was looking at Jimmy Page and, and uh, Peter Townsend. Those are, those are my, Mick Jagger was as close to being flamboyant as I could think about being. And um, those were my heroes, you know. And a guy like Dave was never somebody that I'd say, oh, I want to be like that. I don't, I like. And truthfully, Dave, what I found out later, was really into me in Montrose. You know, I was, had that long mane of hair and I went this up there. This is before you went with Van Halen. Yeah, before Van Halen. The Van Halen guys were looking at Montrose like, we want to be like these guys, right? But he took a different, he took a different turn. Uh, it's hard for me to um, remember, but when I walked into the room with Eddie, Alex, and Michael and Van Halen uh, before that show, and we, I said, let's see what these guys got. You know, I, I didn't like that band necessarily. I said, well, I like Eddie's guitar playing. He's a genius, right? But I don't like their image. I don't want to be like that. So let's see what they want from me. Right. And when we just started playing music and I started singing, and they're looking at me like, whoa, you can hit that note? Yeah. Well, you can do this. You can do this. Eddie's going, wait a minute, whoa. Eddie goes over the keyboard. Hey, what, what would you do to this? And, and we, you know, like, look, I'm getting goosebumps because it was so magic. It was like, whoa. And I'm looking at him going, you can play that keyboard like that? You know, well, let's write this song. And we, we were just like kids, and, and we just went nuts. And we just didn't even consider anything any of us had done previously. Well, at that time, I'm taking you back in time. You were literally in the process of trying to decide to go with Van Halen. And you said it was a magic moment for you. You still get goosebumps over it. But at that time, what did you think of David Lee Roth? To me, I wasn't buying it. There was something that was fake about him. I know his, the old Van Halen fans would, if I'd have said that in the beginning, would have crucified me. But he was the enemy. Eddie and, they all hated Dave at that point. You know, he quit the band, he left us high and dry, and now Sammy's our hero, you know. You know, and now in time, things have went all these, you know, like this twice, you know. I came in, him went in, he went again. And it's like, uh, it's such a mess now that I feel confident in saying that. He was a showman, period. That's what you thought. Liberace yeah. was a great showman, but he could play piano. You know, he's in pretty good shape. He's got his little dance and his show and he's got his rap. But dude, this is Van Halen. This is music, real music. You know, Eddie, one of the greatest genius musicians in rock ever. And uh, you're going to sing to that stuff. You should put a little <laughs> something in there. I'm not jealous. I'm not, uh, you know, uh, Dis dislike the guy. I don't, I don't like him. I don't dislike him. I was around him. He, he toured with me. We did the Sam and Dave tour and, and we went out for a while. Well, what's the best thing you can say about him? That in his day, he was a great showman. Like, you know, the early Van Halen stuff. He really helped show Eddie to the world. With his antics, he got attention. And then they went, who's that guitar player? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so let me say something good about it. Those early songs were great. Lyrically even, as silly as Jump is, it's right on the money. When I heard that song on the radio, I went, damn, those guys did it again, you know? Jump! Eddie was so brilliant that you could yell and scream over the top of that, and it was going to be good because he invented something that was unique to your ear. So when you heard a Van Halen song, you heard one of them guitar riffs. <laughs> Looking back now, that stuff was really, really good. It was bright and shiny and fun. And so everyone liked it. Girls liked it. Guys liked it, you know. Uh, it was brilliant. And uh, so that, I can say that Dave was part of that, and he deserves all the credit in the world for that. I want you to take me inside. You, you said to yourself that, you know, you lived the life of sex, drugs, rock and roll. Did you ever? Take me inside. Tell me things that neither I nor anyone on the outside knows about what goes on on the inside. <laughs> oh, Dan, you're asking. You might get me in trouble. You know, I'm, my wife knows everything. She read the book, and, and my children even read the book. Uh, I can be honest and tell you that everything in there was true <laughs> and that the sex part of it was I I'm bordering a sex addict I must admit not I don't you know 
cheat on my wife anymore. You know, my this wife, I don't cheat on my ex-wife. It's, it's the worst husband in the world. But um, I really wallowed in that a lot because it was just so damn much fun. I mean, the, just to be able to be on stage in the biggest band in the world, you know, and and just go, look at your guy on the side, point to that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. They go out, they give him passes. It's time for Eddie's guitar solo, which usually took about 17 to 20 minutes. I go down to my little booth where I had a little, my little private room. We all had our little private rooms. And those girls would be in there. And, I mean, it was just like, not even like, it just, okay, may the best one win, you know? <laughs> it's like, it's, no, I don't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> and your business stand, you mean you guys don't do that? <clears throat> that was a run for about five or six years where I, I burned myself out on, on sex. Not to where I didn't want it anymore. Um, now that I couldn't I have believe. orgasm. That, that I don't believe. No, 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 that's what I mean. No, not that I didn't want it. <laughs> I couldn't have orgasm for like, you know, for four or five days at a time. And I'd have sex three or four times a day. Might be too much information for me. Well, that you asked for it. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I asked for it. But it, it was that kind of a thing. For me, that's that was my big indulgement. You know, the drug spider, yeah, you know, not, no big deal at all. I mean, I'm doing a little cocaine or something, it'd be around and... Then I'd start thinking, hey, it's like four o'clock in the morning. I got to sing tomorrow night. I got to get out of here. And, you know, I always had those kind of uh, discipline and everybody else didn't. But um, the drinking, same thing. I never liked to get drunk. So I'd be drinking, I'd drink and then I'd be done. But the sex, I couldn't, I couldn't stop. Get the knock on the door at four in the morning. I'd be like, oh, okay, ooh, come on in, you know. Um, pretty, pretty fun. I mean. Well, I think it's probably time we change the subject. Before doing so, should I be afraid to throw a rock down the street for fear of hitting one of your, your children out there somewhere? Well, no, because in this world, I would have been, I, I would have been uh, definitely, someone would have come after me. You know what I mean? You, you, yeah, you see a rock star. money. They, deep, uh, yeah. yeah. And I'm so lucky. I never had a venereal disease in my life, ever. And a lot of times, I didn't, you know, say say I didn't suit up, you know, because it was just a spontaneous situation, you know. But um, I was careful. I was just, you know, I mean, I, I'm once again, I have discipline, and uh, so. Like Tell me say, about your best time with Van Halen. What was the very best time you can remember? Ooh, there were so many good times. There was nine years of nothing but the best, rich. You know, fame and fortune, and indulgence, and never having a down thing. Nothing happened bad for like <laughs> uh, probably seven years. Right. Um, but one of the highlights was definitely when our first album got together. We did our thing. We'd already played Shreveport. I remember when we. So when you think about the area. So when we hit Atlanta, you know, a week later, ten days later, the album came out, went number one. When we and we were in Atlanta, right. Georgia. And we, none of us had ever had a number one album. We'd had everything else, <laughs> let me tell you. But uh, we just sat in a room and, and just hugged and just high-fived. It was such a good feeling. It was such a, a great thing that we, yeah, we did it. You know, like, you know, everyone was questioning it. Hey, is this going to work with Sammy? You know, hey, Dave, just like what you said, you know, Dave was such a flamboyant character. Can you feel them shoes? And we were in there making this music going, yeah, shut up. You know, these guys don't say, hell, wait till they hear this. Wait till they hear this. And when they heard it, you know, and it exploded. And uh, that was a big moment for all of us. That was the best of times. What was the worst of times with Van Halen? Well, the worst part about the worst thing that happened to Van Halen before the reunion, because the reunion was its own thing. That didn't even, that don't even <laughs> register in any, in any rock and roll story. It just was so bizarre. But the ending, our manager, my dear friend and mentor, Mr. Ed Leffler, who was my manager when I joined Van Halen, had been my manager through my whole career, 10 years. And uh, one man dog, he managed Sammy Hagar, and when I joined Van Halen, he managed Van Halen until 1995 when he died of cancer. It was a horrible thing. And when he died, it's like the band just went pyrrhon. Everyone just, every vulture came at us. 
every manager on the planet, every promoter, every this, every that, record company executives, everyone came after us and we were vulnerable. These people came after us and just destroyed that band, ate us alive. Everybody went to Eddie, the guy who had never opened his mouth, who was not a leader in any way. I was the leader of that band. David Lee Roth was the leader of that band. They come to Eddie, you're gonna let this guy run your band? He, you know, because I would say, fuck you, get out of here, you know what I mean? Hey. We, we ain't going with you. You know, I'd tell the guys, hey, we're not going to talk to those assholes. I know who those people are. But they go to Eddie. And they would go to Eddie and say, you let this guy make it. You know what this guy said? He said it. And they just turned us against each other, and I got thrown out of the band. Uh, they, they got a new manager who came in through the back door, and he came in and poisoned the other guys. And as soon as I left and everything bombed and everything he had planned went into the toilet, they fired him. <laughs> and it's just been chaotic ever since. Been chaotic ever since. That include the reunion. Yeah. You said before it was a disaster. It was the worst experience in my life. Tell me about it. Eddie was completely whacked out off the charts uh, on alcohol and drugs, and poor guy, I mean, he was really in bad shape. I thought he was going to die. Go on YouTube and listen to the, to the 04 reunion song. You couldn't even recognize the song. There would be nights where He'd start the song, and I'd look at Mike and look at Al, and we'd all be, hmm, look at the set list. Whew, that ain't the song, but it ain't nothing like it. I never heard it. And then he'd noodle around, and then finally he'd fall into the thing, and it would kind of be like the song, and it was rough. I was, and then I tried to quit after uh, 40 shows. We had 80 shows. We did a contract, and I tried to, I said, I can't do this anymore. You know, the guy's going to die, first of all. Every night it would be like, I'd sit in my dressing room and wait till I heard his guitar go, and I'd look at Mike and go, he's up there. It was that kind of a deal. And so I went out and played, and it was horrible. He did horrible things to people. He treated people so bad. He was a complete raven maniac. I've never met a person like this in my life, trying to bust windows out of a G5 airplane at 40,000 feet with a wine bottle smashing wine flying all over the roof. It ain't even our plane. It's a rental plane. You know, kicking windshields out of cars, you know, turning his uh, hotel room upside down, wearing the same clothes for five days, on stage, off stage, no shirt, you know, just going around freezing cold, snowing outside. He's walking around with no shirt, bottle of wine in his hand, no teeth. I mean, it was horrible. I just don't know how he let himself go to that point. And when I tried to quit, there was a, an attorney that drew up a contract, I guess, that I signed that said, uh, I'd have to pay these guys off for all the money they would have lost. And, 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 and yeah, so I stuck it out, and I haven't, knocked, I haven't talked to the guy since, and I still really, really have a bad taste about what happened on that thing. And thank God he got himself together. He would not be alive another year. Well, I guess the next tour he went out on, he ended up in the hospital. But Eddie's a sweet human being. He's talented, and he's a sweet, wonderful heart guy. He's got some demons, <laughs> you know? And he's not the only person I know like that. But uh, when I saw those demons take over, it was pitiful because he was, the, when we got along good, he was one of the best friends I've ever had. Sad. Always tough when you lose a friend. It is. There is no doubt that Sammy Hagar leads a fast life, and not just with music. For as long as he can remember, he told me, he's been fascinated with cars, real expensive cars. In his garage are now parked 17, many of them six-figure Ferraris. He still has the black Ferrari that was used in the video for his breakout hit in 1984 called I Can't Drive 55. Tell me about I Can't Drive 55. <laughs> well, Dan, it's the truth. It's um, your best known song. Would you say it's your best known song? Yeah. That song has earned more 
money from different types of, of licensing, you know, for TV commercials, for movies, for uh, football games, for, I don't know, for NASCAR races, you know, Indy 500, um, then any song, including the Van Halen songs like Right Now, you know, Right Now is a very big licensed song, right. um, but I Can't Drive 55 is my number one performing song in my whole career. So question, what was your driving record before you <laughs> did I Can't Drive 55? <laughs> My driving record was pitiful. I think I had like 43 tickets or something like that. I had my license taken away three times. My, my insurance for the kind of cars I had, and back then I didn't have as much as I got now, but I had some pretty nice cars, uh, was like $120,000 a year. And um, it was getting rough. <laughs> when I, like, you know, if I, like one more ticket and you're going to lose everything. You're not going to be able to drive. They're going to take your license away for good and, eh, you know, and, so I, I, when I wrote that song, um, it changed everything. It's, uh, people don't realize that I've, <laughs> I shouldn't I gotta be careful saying this, you know, <laughs> I've only had two tickets since 1984 and nothing's changed in the way I drive. I get pulled over all the time. And oh, you get pulled over all the time and because you're who you are, cops says, I'll let you go. Yeah, I feel kind of guilty saying that, but sorry, <laughs> it's true. It's true. And if there's one car that will surely got you pulled over, it is this speedster. Sammy Hagar is the proud owner of this rare Ferrari, a $1.3 million rocket on wheels. You know, the craftsmanship, that the hand work, this is all handmade and it just... Sammy told me that in order to get on the list for one of these incredible machines, you have to purchase three Ferraris a year for three years. I bet your car payments are very high. <laughs> That's about $3 million. And even then, you aren't guaranteed one. So when Sammy offered to take me for a spin, I knew this was one opportunity I couldn't pass up. Now, Dan, here's the best way to get in. Here, watch this. You sit, you just sit right here, kind of, you know. Right. And then okay. you slide your butt in, and they got, got and there's a handle right here. I got there it. There you go. And then just swing in swing and swing around. your feet around the best you can. Look at us. Me and Uncle Dan are going to go <laughs> for a little ride. <laughs> <laughs> It's like being in the cockpit of some it, space shuttle. It really is a space shuttle. And there's no trunk, nothing. Look at this. Here's the glove compartment. Look at this. It's got enough room for... Come for on. a Kleenex. For, no, for the registration. That's it. Right. That's it. I can see why you fall in love with it. It's just a piece of art, you know, and functional art. Drive the damn thing. Did you ever race cars? I did a couple of times. I ain't got the guts for that, man. It's These cars are so over... You know, I'm so, they're so overqualified. I'm so underqualified to drive the damn car, you know. I could get on a racetrack, and this car, that could probably beat anything on the street, and some guy could get in that little car over there and beat my ass, because <laughs> I'm chicken. Well, I'll tell you something, confidentially. I don't feel qualified to even ride in it. <laughs> I told you, it's like bungee jumping. <laughs> Being in that seat is like saying, no, it's like, what do you call those guys that dive out of airplanes with somebody on their back? Yeah. <laughs> You're the guy on the guy's back. <laughs> oh, shit. No, it's a beautiful car. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. It's car. very special. It's got an um, electric motor in it for the front wheels. Mm -hmm. And when it stops, once it's warmed up, the engine goes off, and you think, hey, the damn thing's stalling. It's not stalling. Now, how many horsepower are you saying? A thousand. A thousand horsepower? A thousand horsepower. It's the uh, latest and the greatest. I'm just barely touching this gas pedal. <laughs> this is the top of the line, called La Ferrari, or the Ferrari. Top speed is over 200 miles per hour. God, it's got this magic feel to it. I've never, I've never been in a Ferrari anywhere near this level. Yeah, this is something out. Well, this is the, 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 there is no Ferrari on this level. This is it. This is the highest. It's a level of This zone. is what they call their Lewis supercar. It's got every bit of technology that Ferrari has in all their F1, it's in this car. It, it does things with the brakes that could blow your mind. Oh, <laughs> that just barely. Well, it just keeps 
doing that. <laughs> and how many gallons to the mile? I don't think there's, I don't think any, I don't think you get any. <laughs> oh, no, any, any gallons in a mile, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> <laughs> the brakes are so good, it's, it probably scares you half to death thinking this something well, ain't going to stop. The first time it did, but yeah. now I realize the brakes no, are so I good on it. I haven't even pushed on them yet. Look at these guys. <laughs> kids in the neighborhood they're going. Yeah, for me it's like a carnival ride. <laughs> that is exactly what it is. <laughs> How about this shit? Huh? <laughs> now watch the police come down. Wow. What if the wow. police if the police came they'll be going, oh hell it's Sammy, no wonder. <laughs> <laughs> we heard something was going on. What the hell? Oh, there we go. I made it without scrape. Ooh, little tiny scrape. You don't get out of this car just as much as you unfold. There you go, Dan. Let me help you out. There we go, like this. There's my brother. Thank you, my brother. <laughs> Thank you, my man. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Woo! What a, a ride. Uh, my famous line, Dan, are we having any fun yet? <laughs> are we having a good time? You know, I have this sense, though, that it's a little underpowered. Yeah, you know, they don't make them like they used to. <laughs> that smog device on there, you know, it slows it down about. <laughs> If this no, thing was any faster, ride. I don't see what you could do. I don't, I don't know what it would be good for. Uh, you know, I haven't even come close to hitting the limits. But look well, at those brakes. Say it's a unique experience to ride it. Look at that brake. That's as yeah. big as most tires on cars. And there's no trunk space anywhere. No, there's yeah. not a trunk in here. Kari can't even take her makeup bag in there without being uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> it's a man's car. Just take a pair of underwear, stick them in your pocket. <laughs> pair of socks, put them in the other pocket, <laughs> and you're good to get a toothbrush in your top pocket, and you're good to go. Straight ahead, a rare treat. Sammy sings From the Heart, a brand new song. You'll want to hear it. Now it's in your You know, I'd talk music with you the rest of the afternoon, but you're a businessman. You're, <laughs> on the record, you're a terrific entrepreneur. So let me move to that. Tell me how this Cabo Wabo tequila brand developed. I think uh, growing up, I was one of those guys that didn't drink much, but when I drank tequila, I liked it. The ritual, the salt, the lime, the party. The, it just seemed like something about tequila made you brought you up and made you like have fun. I wasn't a beer drinker, I couldn't stand beer. Anyway, so I, when I opened the Cabo Wabo, I went to Mexico and bought a place in, in uh, Cabo San Lucas in 1983. And um, I started living down there. And so I said, I'm gonna build my own little place. You know, I'm self -indulgent. I'm a rock star, I'm rich, you know, I'm gonna do this. This is before Van Halen. I was already thinking <laughs> like that. <laughs> so um, I started building the Cabo Wabo when I, after, right after I joined Van Halen. Um, and I wrote the song Cabo Wabo, and I said, I'm gonna build this place, and I'm gonna have a tequila bar, because when I was down there, the tequila was different than when I was drinking in America. I was drinking 100% agaves down there. I didn't realize it, what, what the whole thing was. I said, man, these tequilas are good. You know, you can drink them. You don't go, Ugh. you don't need the salt in the lime. So once I built the Cabo Wabo, I put this guy out and said, hey, can I make my own tequila? He goes, yeah, these guys down there make it for you. You, wanna, you should go. I said, well, let's go. So we went to tequila, went to Guadalajara, and, went over to Jalisco and went around all these little places. And these guys got their own little vats and these own little pull, jump your Evian bottle out and fill it up with tequila and take a little swig. He said, wow, this is the best tequila I ever had in my life. Would you make it for him? Guys, you bring me the bottles. He tells my interpreter guy, you bring me the bottles and I'll fill them up for you. <laughs> like that, that simple. And that's how Cabo Bobble started. And you got in the tequila business. Yeah. I mean, stepped in it. It's like walking and something gets in your shoe and you go, man, I can't get this off. It well, was so un unbelievably organic. <laughs> well, in a paraphrase, fair to say, 
Cabo Wabo tequila has been very, very good to you. Yes, sir, it has. You built it into a hell of a business. Yeah. How did that happen? You're a rock musician. People don't think of you as being a businessman, uh, entrepreneur. I'm of the opinion you don't build companies that sell for $100 million just by accident. <laughs> I'm laughing because, see, here we go again. You say, why is Sammy laughing? Why is he always so happy? Because okay. things like that happen for me. Um, I got to say, I, I, I run into good people by accident and that can help me do things. But Warren Buffett hired me to do um, speak at his summit, the GE summit he does for his... I'm getting a picture of this. The Red Rocker is doing a gig for Warren Buffett. Not playing, speaking. No, no, I understand. Yeah. That yeah. He's doing a, a business gig. He read my book, I guess. Or someone in his organization read my book. I don't know how it works. And he just said, wow, I want to get this guy to speak to my top CEOs in my companies, my, you know, 1,000 people, whatever it was, 600 or so. And... Uh, because he thinks out of the box, and I want them to think more like that. And so I get in a room with, I do it, of course. You're going to turn Warren Buffett? First of all, he paid me like a rock star money. And I'm going, damn, I'd do this for free, but sure. So I wanted to meet Warren, so we sat in a room for 45 minutes and just talked and yacked and yacked, and he said, you think different. You know, he goes, you know, I want my guys to think like that. They're, they're coming to that corporate place, you know, because I had no schooling to it. You know, he goes, how'd you do it? He asked me how I did it, and I said, well, I don't know what I'm doing, but I know how to do it. You know, I can get it done. I'll, I'll get it done, you know. And I had a passion for that brand. I loved that tequila. I thought it was the best tequila in the world, you know, like in my heart. And I just put a band together. I call them the Wobberitas, which was an, a drink I invented with it. We went on tour, played 135, 40 shows a year for about five years. Stage said, Cobble Wobble, I'm bringing waitresses out on stage bringing me margaritas in the middle of the show with my bottle and and I'm just promoting it for 10,000 people every night every night and it just worked what other businesses have you developed <laughs> oh man it's kind of, it's it, it's kind of it's almost embarrassing to me to think about everything I've done because it makes me sound like I've never slept a day in my life <laughs> I don't know how I do it I started fire sprinkler business to, uh, in, in homes and apartment buildings and businesses where, you know, uh, I was building f uh, apartment buildings with my brother-in-law. I was financing and he was a contractor. We were building this apartment building empire because I wanted to be rich. And it was when I was first just making money. And they said, you got to put a, a fire hydrant in it. Fire hydrant is like, you know, $3,000 to, you're going to build the apartment. I'm going, what the hell? And he's going, oh, there's this new thing called fire sprinklers. You know, they weren't really new, but, you know, they weren't demanded for homes. And he started, put, he got a plumber's license, started putting those in for $1,100, right? right. And, and they're safer. Everything is better. Then the fire department says, hey, we're going to pass the law, make sure everybody has to have these. I'm going, I own the company. All right, sure. And so the company, you know, went to be the number one fire sprinkler thing in California. But that was a business that I started just out of, once again, I just knew a guy that could do it. And I thought, yeah, it's a good idea. Let's do it. I had my bicycles company. I had the bike companies um, and uh, where I sold mountain bikes. And the inventors, you know, Steve Potts and Gary Fisher, the inventors of mountain bikes, they were right from here. So. I'm interested to know where this comes from. Now, where does this come from? This <laughs> recognize a new product or a product that's particularly good and developing it into a real business. I mean, listen, you, you've made serious money with these business ideas. More than music. I mean, everyone thinks I'm crazy to say that, but I've made much more money outside of the music industry. The so music did, industry gave me the money to start the business, but... So where did this, this business gene, from? where did that come? I don't know. My parents weren't even educated. My mom went to the eighth grade. My mom and dad both went to the eighth grade, and, and uh, I didn't even finish high school. I mean, I finished high school, but I didn't really go on. You know, I got thrown out, so I didn't get a diploma, but I mean, I, I finished. Um, I just had, I was poor. And, I'm, you know, when I was walking around my neighborhood, when I was in fifth grade, sixth grade, I was pushing a lawnmower door to door, trying to, you know, say, man, I need to get some new jeans, man. I'm not, you know, my mom didn't have the money. So I just figured, <laughs> I figure, out, I don't know. It's a, like I say, it's almost embarrassing because it's like, it's so silly when I look back now that I was so into it and I still am. I get excited about a, a new idea. 
It's creativity. It's just like writing a song. You know, I tell young people all the time, you know, go, oh, I want to, you know, how do I get like you, man? You know, the guy, they're on their first album. Yep. And I'm going, dude, it's going to take a long time. You know, you're not going to get, I've worked my ass off my whole life. And I've had some, you know, failures, you know, and stuff. And you got to just eat that and roll them up and get back on the train, you know, on the horse. And, uh, it's it's no easy way. There's no shortcut to to uh, what I've got anyway. You know, there is no shortcut. More of my interview with Sammy Hagar when we come back. From songs to sauces, Sammy Hagar has written a cookbook, opened restaurants around the country, and shared culinary secrets with some of the world's greatest chefs. Hey, go ahead, Sammy. Oh, and all them, all them goodies in Get there. Get all those yum yums. Yeah, They're absolutely know, good. And this doesn't matter how pretty it is, because you're going to no. put a whole bunch of other good well, we're stuff gonna, in here. Exactly. I ate at your restaurant here in Mill Valley, California last night. It was terrific. Often, you know, somebody lends their name to a restaurant, and they have about as much to do with the restaurant as King James did with writing the Bible. But in this case, the restaurant was really good. How did you get into the food cooking business? Well, first of all, anything I do, I am a hands-on. I will drive people crazy, you know? It's because I want everything I do to be great. That's the other thing about going back to your success. What's success, you know, how do you do this? Well, it's gotta be good. It's gotta be great. It's gotta compete, you know? You can't just throw your name on something and think that's gonna, be enough. It is not, you know. So with my restaurants and stuff like that, I was raised with good food. I told you my grandfather was a great chef. Italian came from Italy, couldn't read or write, but that sucker could go into the kitchen and knock out anything and you just go, oh my God, Grandpa, this is so good. You know, and my mom was great, great cook too at home. And uh, so I was raised that way. Poor, like I said, had our own garden always, had our own chickens. We ate eggs. We killed the chickens on Sunday, you know, <laughs> chicken on every Sunday. And um, all that, you know, even when my mom left my dad, there would have been times when we took the damn chickens, you know. And she'd <laughs> take them over to Grandpa's house and leave in the cage, her best layers, you know. And, and my grandpa would say, happy as a snake, you know. Man, yeah, I got them chickens. So everything was homemade, bread, pastas. My grandpa would go shoot rabbits and deer, string them up, make meatballs, and we'd have steaks and jerky. And everything was just like that. Tomatoes were canned. We never bought nothing. Once you grow up eating like that with a great chef, like a grandpa, you don't realize it until, like, say, you go out on the road, and I go out with Montrose, and we got $10 a day per diem, and we're sharing a room in a cheap hotel, and we go down and find the cheapest place to eat, and it would be like, I'm going, man, I can't eat this food. I didn't know, you know? I didn't know that what hamburgers and fast food places taste like. I kind of dig them now, every now and then, but back then it was like, man, this ain't cool, you know? And in our dressing room, they'd have this bologna, cheap, really bad bologna, and really bad white bread, and that was it, you know? And I'd, we'd be starving and be eating it, you know, and some like cheap cheese, and, and I'd be going, this is horrible, you know? And when I got home after being out on the road for about a year, and I went and tasted my mom's food and grandpa's food again, I just said, I get it, I get it. And so w when I got married at a young age, I was poor as well. I started have my own garden and started doing all that. And it's still every home we have, we have chickens, we have a garden, and, and we, I live that way. And and uh, so when my restaurants are good. <laughs> and listening to your biographical book, you have the cookbook. Yeah, it was a blast. I loved writing that book. That book was more fun. <laughs> and I, because we cooked every day, and there's some great recipes. There's a chicken recipe in there called Antonio's Chicken that Thomas Keller, the greatest, one of the greatest chefs in the world, right. uh, just put that recipe in his new book, in his magazine for his uh, yearly thing for his restaurant. For well, there's a compliment. It is, and he he put my recipe in there and, and said it was from my book because he was saying this is good eats, and it's so good and it's so simple anyone can make it. A, a 14 year old person, kid that never cooked the boiled water in her life or his life could make this recipe. If they just follow it, it's very simple. Well, that's the food. I want to check something. True or untrue? They used to have vintage bottles of wine, vintage, very expensive bottles of wine backstage 
as part of your contract. True or untrue? True. Pretty egotistical. First growth, Bordeaux's at the time. Now, now I go with Barolos and wines that I would drink now. But though I was collecting those wines, and then I got when I got more famous, I started demanding five, the first top five growths. You know, Cheval Blanc, Latour, Lafitte, Margot, Aubryon, all in my dressing room. And and Bill Graham, the late great, the most brilliant pr promoter of all time, who knew what I was doing because I'd been made the circuit four or five yeah. years in a row, and he. And I'd say, don't open my wines, because I would put them in his case and bring them home, and I built a million dollar wine cellar this way, right? <laughs> and he, he opened every one of them one night, and, and backstage he had them all opened. That way you don't get to save them. Right, well, they were brand new. You can't drink those wines for 10 years, right? And you gotta age them out, but I would get the latest, you know? And he, he opened them all, and he knew, he came in laughing, and he gave me a recorker for, for as a... Well, I've heard <laughs> stories about people demanding a certain color M&Ms backstage, but I've never heard anybody saying vintage wine so I can save them for later. What are you up to these days? Whew, boy, I got so many projects going. Uh, I've got a few more restaurants opening, another one in Maui, because uh, mine's in the airport, right. and, and airports are, you know, you can't go, my fans can't go there, so I'm building a Cabo Wabo with some other people in Maui, well, we're, we're trying to, we're trying to put that together now. And then another one maybe in Honolulu, and then one in uh, NASA, mm -hmm. and down there in the Bahama areas. And um, I want to tell everyone straight up, restaurants do not make you rich. You got to be so lucky. I mean, I got a couple that'll make you rich, right? The one in Cabo, the one in Las Vegas. Those two restaurants are like friggin' oil wells. But most of them, like my favorite one, El Paseo, it doesn't make that much money. I mean, it makes money, but right. not like real money. Not worth the headache, not worth all this, unless you love the business. I love the business. I love making people happy, having a place where they can come and eat and get a great meal and great wine and say, wow, Sammy was right, this place is great, you know? And that means a lot to me. It just warms my heart and it makes me feel like my fans who, if I'm not gonna go out and tour, okay, you can go to one of my places and you can have the same hospitalities. When I walk out on that stage, hospitality comes, you know, I'm there to serve. And with your music, you now have two bands. <laughs> yeah, The Circle and Chicken Foot, I would say. And the difference between the two? Chicken Foot only plays our original Chicken Foot material, like we're uppity, we're artsy, we're an artsy band. Like, <laughs> nope, we don't do anything cheap. And the circle, we play all my greatest hits. We play all the Van Halen greatest hits. We play Chicken Foot hits. We play Montrose hits. And we play Van Halen hits. And we play Led Zeppelin. I made myself a note here. Early on in your career, Shep Garden who was managing Alice Cooper at the time, asked you whether you wanted to be rich <laughs> or famous. Now, you turned out you've been both, and you are both. But back to the basic question. If you have to choose between rich and famous, what do you choose? Oh, it's being poor, I'd have to go with rich. I've been poor, and rich is much better. I mean, <laughs> and rich, I don't mean it in an egotistical way, but having a lot of money is so much fun. I'm, I'm the biggest fan of what you can do. You know, after you finish taking care of yourself and your mom, bought my mom her first house, bought my mom brand new cars, sent her all over the world, you know. Um, once you do all that, then you can help people. And there's so many people that need help in a world that, you know, I started a foundation with my wife, Hagar Family Foundation, and, and Every town I play in, I give back to food banks, and uh, every town, like I get my check, here's yours. Families with terminally ill children that have run out of money and insurance, right. that's what rich people can do. Like, that's awesome, that's all I wanna do anymore. Like, that gets so good to you. <laughs> you start going, well, I just wanna do more of that. That made me feel so good, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's great. So I'm, I'm all for being rich, famous to hell with that. I mean, right now in my life, I'm thinking about, well, 
I like being famous because I like being able to call up that restaurant you can't get into, and I want those front row tickets to that fight that you can't get. You know, <laughs> I like fame for all that. But as far as you know, walking into the men's bathroom in some restaurant and the guy's going, "Hey, Sammy, man, <laughs> can I take a picture?" And you go, "Can you give me a minute?" You know, that part of fame is it's goofy. But I'd rather be famous than not famous, I guess. But I'd certainly rather be rich than poor. Let's talk about your charity work. You mentioned one of the things that gives you joy, maybe the main thing that gives you joy, is doing something for other people. In my business, I run across a lot of people who give lip service to that, but I've checked it out, and you have the record to prove it. So two things I have to say about charity. Number one, you do it. You get in there and put your hand, get your hands dirty. You know, you just write the check, don't do crap. I mean, it does a lot of great, don't get me wrong. Write the check if that's all you can do. But for me, I didn't get as much joy until I did start doing things. You know, when I go down to the food bank, I had to food out. You know, my wife and my daughters do it every year. The other thing is meeting the people that you're helping. Like there's been a couple of kidney transplants that I helped um, with kids in Hawaii from my first really big restaurant over there besides Cabo Wobble, Sammy's Beach Bar and Grills, where I give all the money from in the community where they are. I brought them to UCSF over here where they did the transplant, a little nine-year-old girl and it was really successful. I brought her parents over. They have to stay for three months, and you know, I do things like that. And when I went back and saw her the year later when she was all better, and she wouldn't look at me, and she cried and put her head down and ran out of the room, and it was destroying, but I felt so much. I mean, I felt something, you know? She was just embarrassed, I guess. I mean, I don't know. Her parents were all crying. They didn't know what to tell me. I'm going, no, it's okay, you know? She just doesn't want to look at me like she felt embarrassed, I guess, but it was so touching that what you felt, God. Mm. Better feeling than being up there on the stage and having people virtually worship you? Different. It's more is what it is. It just, it's, um, it's more. That thing on stage is so flattering and so, so egotistically wonderful, <laughs> you know? I mean, nothing's wrong with that. But, um, it makes you feel good that people love you. Everyone wants to be loved. That's a great thing, yes, but, but that other thing, it just, I don't know, it just goes deeper. It feels closer to God. I'm Sammy Hagar. I'm going to take you on a rock and roll road trip. Woo, let's go. While Sammy no longer tours the world with Van Halen, He's on his own rock and roll road trip, hosting a new television program. This week, we're heading to L.A. and the Sunset Strip for a little rock history at the Whiskey Well, tell me about your new show. You're, you're, you're into television. Well, Dan, I want to be like you when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If I yeah. ever do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I, um, I'm always trying to do frontiers, you know, and... and uh, if, I, if I'm not going to go out and tour like I used to, because I can't. At my age, I'm telling you, I, if I go out there for two weeks, I feel like I'm going to, you know, I'm going, I just don't want to play a show tonight. I don't think I got it in me. And I don't like feeling like that. When I go on stage, I want to feel like I want to be there. So I'm thinking, how am I going to keep my brands and all my things, my beach bar rum and all this alive? And how am I going to stay, you know, relevant in the world without working my butt off going on tour, which is the, the way I've always done it. And I thought, I'll get my own TV show. I just go around visiting my friends at their houses, with Sammy's Rock and Roll Road Trip. And... Rock and Roll Road Trip. Yeah. But it's not really what you might imagine. Rock and Roll Road Trip conjures up an image of you got the band and you're on tour. That's not what this show's about. No. There's my old buddy Mickey Hart hey. in the house right there, Mickey. How you doing, buddy? It's a road trip where I get in one of my cars or I get on my plane and I go visit my friends at their house or in their hometown, and I talk to them the way you talk to me. I'm probably not quite as educated here in my life. <laughs> like I told you, my, I'm guilty of, of asking a guy a question and then giving him the answer. <laughs> you, you could slap me if I did that. Uh, but I'm, I'm trying to uh, get good at really getting to know um, other musicians, that, guys that I know a little bit, you know? Like, it's not my best friends. I mean, some of them are good friends, but... You know, I haven't really interviewed some of my best friends yet, and, and uh, which would be fun too. But I, I wanna, I wanna reveal 
Tommy Lee, when I went to his house, I said, Tommy, and it's all stone what do you want to talk about? I don't, he said, well, I don't want to talk about Motley Crue. And I said, okay, fine, we won't talk about Motley Crue, right? I don't blame you. Been in that band your whole life, tired of talking about Motley Crue. I said, so what do you want to tell me? He goes, well, I like to cook. And I said, well, no, what are you into? He goes, I'm into cooking. And says that to me, I'm going, let's cook, right? Get out the pots and pans. I'm just really impressed at your chopping skills. Sometimes you don't always pay attention to the to the recipes, but you pay attention to the safety shit because you're like, I need these. So it's kind of a reality show like that where we're winging it, but, um, and then we play music. There's always a musical element where I do that. Mm -hmm. Say, show me your newest song. What do you, you know, what do you want to jam, you know? And uh, it's a cool show. I'm really digging it. I'm really, really liking it. How about playing me a tune or two? I would love to. I hope I don't, uh, I cut my finger cooking, slicing uh, something, but I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can do it. Uh, hopefully I just don't start bleeding. If I have to stop in the middle, we can edit and. Is what I want to do, if you don't mind, Dan. Thank you. Is I'm gonna play you a song I just wrote. When I went through all this um, family therapy thing that I did, which was just one of the most wonderful things I've ever done, because I got to hear how my kids really think about their mom and dad. Whew. Once again, deep. <laughs> I'm so soft. I might need my sunglasses again. So I wrote this little lullaby. No one's ever heard this. See if I can remember it. It's called Inner Child. Searching for my inner child I wanna let him out, let him run wild Anybody seen my best friend That little child within Been locked away, forgotten time I wanna set him free done it's my inner latest child, song the inner child yeah it's really hard for me to sing that song because it, it's very deep you know it's about me it's about my kids about my grandkids about my mom and dad it's about you know everything so of all the miles all the times you've had i'm a little surprised your inner child is still relevant to you <clears throat> um I found out that all my problems are being caused in life by my inner child. You know, that little guy that, um, that was hurt as a child, you know, and felt those things. And even though I've accomplished everything and more than I could ever dreamed, ever dreamed, uh, 
that little guy is still stirring around in there. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, you think you're above it until someone pushes that little trigger. Like when your daughter says something to you that gets that guy. Whew, and you realize that you're still carrying, you know, we all just carry everything through our lives. I don't think we ever get rid of it. Uh, you know, you can rise above it and go as high as you want, but um, I don't think therapy and all that stuff, you know, digging in the dirt and, and churning it all back up and re-looking at it, doesn't mean anything. It's still going to be there. And I like that little guy. I've decided that I like that little guy. <laughs> and that little guy I was speaking now, the inner, the inner child, that little guy was most wounded by your parents splitting? No, I think by the humiliation uh, and, and the insecurities of seeing my dad, you know, hurt my mom um, and, and having, um, seeing my dad, you know, walking down the street, a bum, you know, like a homeless person. Me and my buddies, when I first get in my cars and we're 16 and we're going around drinking beer and driving around and looking for girls and all of a sudden to see my dad walking down the street, you know, like, and... Uh, there are times where I have to act like I didn't know what it was, you know. That's, that's not easy. Not easy, indeed. Well, Sammy, thank you. Appreciate it. Dan, I'm a it's huge fan great. of your show, and I'm honored to be on it. Well, I appreciate, appreciate you being on it. Honored to see you. Great fun, and I learned a lot. Thank you. And that's the big interview for tonight. We're always eager to hear what you have to say, so please follow us on Facebook and Twitter or send your comments to viewer at access.tv.